good even now. Hi, Sam. How you doing? <laughs> Sorry, I missed last week. I, I forgot. <laughs> oh yeah, that's easy to do. Uh, uh, so I was watching some basketball, and all of a sudden I realized, oh my gosh, I totally missed the class. So I watched it. I watched it recording. Well, that's good. Yeah, that's the recording. Too good for that. Well, Sam, I have a question for you. Yeah. Who is this Patricia as bone I keep seeing? <laughs> on your, some of your, some of your Twitter. She's my sister. She teaches uh, anatomy and physiology to nurses. Okay. In, uh, Milwaukee. Okay. I just had to ask. <laughs> yeah. All right, so we're gonna we're gonna wrap it up tonight, right? We are. We are. Okay, yeah. I'm gonna mute myself and just listen to you. Okay. Yeah. All right. Bye. I see Jim made it. Hi. Yeah. yeah. I'll uh, guess I'll give it another minute or so and see who else shows up. So this is the last class. Um, I'll cover this last topic and that's it. I'll wait till 6.02. worth it. I guess not. Well, I imagine some people may trickle in later, but we can just take off. Oh, let's see what this chat message is. Just us. Yeah, looks like it will be just us. That's all right. Well, usually I've noticed some people wandering late. Same thing happens in my face-to-face -face classes. Anyway, let's just start off. So we're in software development security. And just as a disclaimer, I've never done this professionally. So I know very little about it, which is exactly the point of CISSP. Remember, it's a mile wide and an inch deep. All they really expect you to do is know some of the terms. And CISSPs are kind of famous for being hazy on the details. Anyway, um, some of this I know. So the types of programming languages, of course. Uh, machine code is the binary language that the processor actually uses. And source code is the human readable language, hopefully, somewhat understandable, like C or Fortran or BASIC. And assembly language is the intermediate step where you compile and you take the actual binary machine language <coughs> and turn it back into a language that's a little bit readable by humans with things like add and subtract and push and or and pop, which do very little. And uh, it is possible to write code there. I used to do it, but uh, it takes an awful lot of work to write very little code, and people prefer to avoid it as much as possible and write in high-level languages. So the compiler translates the source code into machine code so it can run. Uh, that is how languages like C work. You write the code, you compile it, and you run just that. Interpreters uh, run each line of code one by one, translating into machine code as it goes, so they run hundreds of times slower than compilers, but they're much more convenient. And bytecode is very popular, um, which is a intermediate form of code, which is compiled into um, a structure that is then run in a Java virtual machine. And as you know, Java is extremely popular, even though it always runs very slowly and is quite difficult to use, because it means your developers only have to write one version and it will run on multiple platforms. Um, a Mac and PC and other platforms just run a Java virtual machine, and they all run the same partially compiled code. Procedural languages are ones that use subroutines and functions. Uh, before this, there were unstructured languages that didn't have subroutines, and you had these long spaghetti code programs, or just use go-to to go to place to place, and that was pretty hard to maintain. So C and Fortran developed this function calling routine, and then later on, the next level of abstraction was object-oriented languages, where you define something like an object, and the object has data, 
fields and methods attached to it, and you can create another object based on the first object that inherits properties from the one above it. And those are the modern languages like C++ and Ruby and Python. And Metasploit is written in Ruby these days. It looks like this. You define a class of Metasploit objects, and uh, it's got an MSF object and an exploit subclass and a remote subclass of that. So this is, uh, this is objects, where you have name of an object and then a method or perhaps some subcontainer, uh, and that's the modern way to do it. There's now fourth generation programming languages that automatically write some of the code. And uh, now that artificial intelligence is really coming out, we're going to have AIs driving our cars, and pretty soon you'll have AIs helping write the code for you. So the uh, in, in developers' uh, environments will be more and more automated and helpful. All right, and there's, uh, okay, let me hit this thing. There we go. So we don't get a lot of incidental noise. Anyway, uh, computer-aided software engineering is where programs help maintain it. So you can have tools, work branches, and environments, and these get up to the limit of the fourth generation languages. All right, if the, um, you can start with high-level requirements, like a stating the goals of what you want, and then code to that, or you can start from bottom up, where you think about what's actually happening inside the computer bit by bit, and try to build it that way. Closed source code is kept secret. Microsoft and Apple, well, Microsoft used to be the king. Apple used to be the king of this, but not anymore. Now Microsoft is. Uh, you can't get the source code of Microsoft Office. It is secret. It's considered very valuable. Uh, the alternative is to have open source, where anybody can see the source code and they can modify it. Open source code is not necessarily free, but it often is free. And uh, there's two kinds of free. One is free that doesn't cost any money, and another kind of free is free in that you are able to modify it. And there's shareware and crippleware, which is software that's not entirely free, but you can use it to some extent without paying for it, but they want you to pay for it after some conditions are met. So software comes with a software license. Public domain is given to the public by the authors, so anybody is free to use it. Uh, proprietary software is copyrighted, and you can get punished for you know, copyright infringement if you don't pay the fee or meet the requirements. There's these end user license agreements people agree to when they start using it. And there are various open source licenses uh, that try to limit what people do with software, even if people that write something public like Linux and donate it to the world usually don't want someone putting it in a box and selling it for money and keeping the money and things like that. There's some limitation to what they want you to do with it. All right, so then there's development methods. Uh, the well, really old one was the waterfall model where you just have a series of steps. You define your requirements, analyze, design, code, test, and you just have a, like an assembly line. Do this stage, this stage, this stage, and out comes the code at the end. And this kind of works for assembling cars, so it didn't turn out to do very well for making software. So the modified waterfall model gave you some chance of kicking things back to be reworked at the previous step. So you could try to deal with the fact that uh, you often discover defects in code that have to be fixed at an earlier step. And then there's another attempt to do it with the sashimi model where the different steps are blurred into each other to deal with this fact that you often discover something that requires you to go back and change something earlier. And then other things came out. Now we've got the Agile Manifesto trying to have new ways to write code to try to make it faster and more responsive and better. And Scrum is another idea where um, I know I think Microsoft was the king of this, where one department would solve their problem by creating a problem for another department. And this was very clear in the Windows 2000 source code that leaked. Long, angry diatribes are in the code blaming how another unit of Microsoft created a huge problem for this one. So to prevent that sort of thing, you have Scrum, where you have a team of programmers and they move through every step. So they can't, there's, there's no way they can hand off a problem to somebody else. Extreme programming is another way where you have pairs of programming, pairs programming together. And the idea is uh, you have two eyes looking at it all the way through and hopefully that makes it more likely that you will have uh, a mistake noticed earlier because if you have a code mistake, or a worse and more commonly, a logic error, where you misunderstand something, 
then it usually turns into a bigger and bigger disaster the further along the development goes. I used to do this when I was a database analyst. I would design databases that controlled everything everybody saw on their screen. And if I did anything wrong, or even if I made any hasty assumption that wasn't always true or an approximation that wasn't perfect, it would create a problem that then grew and grew and grew as people would see bad information on their screen and make more and more bad decisions from it. The spiral model is another one where you have these projects and you go around and around the circle. So you start with implementing it, then you have an acceptance test and the design, risk analysis, then you review it, revise your plan and try again and again and again and go around and around in a loop here until you make it as good as you want to make it. Rapid application development is another way. This is a system that uses a lot of quick prototypes where you throw things together quickly to get some idea how you're going to, how they're going to work and then improve them later. Prototyping is mock-ups of code where you do something that, that shows the essential features of something without the time-consuming details so customers can see if they like it before you waste a lot of time in developing it. All right. And uh, Microsoft has the software development life cycle. They're very proud of it. Uh, this, I think, should be life cycle, not live. I don't know why it's a V there. And um, the, uh, this is something Microsoft has worked on, and they praise and recommend for other people. And it's also in a, uh, a NIST publication. Uh, so every, you have a security view at every step. So you got initiation, you develop and acquire code, you implement it. Uh, determine its operation, and then you have a plan for disposal, and you have a security plan right from the start. That's the plan. So you prepare your plan, you have a sensitivity assessment where you determine uh, how important the data you're dealing with is, then you incorporate your requirements in the specification, implement them, have testing and accreditation, and then you have operation and maintenance, which is audits and monitoring to see if there are problems emerging, and at the end you have disposal, uh, you archive what part you want to keep, and you sanitize the part you're trying to discard so that nobody can recover data off it uh, from machines and things that you're throwing away. All right, so you got a product team focused on the customer, and the idea here is to be more agile. I think this is probably, uh, um, IBM is probably the king of failing at this stuff. They said it would take them nine months to ship an empty box. So they, they fail very much in the agility. Why is this not the secure systems development life cycle? Uh, I'm not sure what the difference is. Sorry about that. There are a few different terms, and I know one of them is the one Microsoft pushes, and there's a government one, and I haven't quite got them all straight in my head. So I don't have a good answer for that question. That's 27, okay. Um, all right, and then there's escrow. Uh, a third party can archive the source code so that if the company abandons the software, you can take the code and continue development on it yourself if you want to. This is a big issue, of course, in computers. Many, many things come out and then they are abandoned and the companies that trusted them are pretty much hosed. Uh, there's another kind of code repository like GitHub that is just a place where you can put code where other people can download it, and that is not intended to keep it secret. So this has turned out to be a big security problem. There was another two big scandals, I think this week, of code in Amazon buckets that should have been private. Um, one was California voter data databases, and the other were government data. And uh, it is quite common that your developers were developing in a private environment on your servers, and then later on, somebody decides to put all that stuff on GitHub without realizing that the developers put secrets, like cryptographic keys in the source code. So there are many, many uh, secrets available on GitHub and other public repositories. Uh, this is part of the general migration to the cloud, which has uh, a series of security problems as stuff that was originally in a controlled, limited environment is suddenly available to everybody. All right, the APIs are the programming interfaces that let you send requests to something. Facebook has a very good API. That's why Facebook is sort of like an operating system. It's intended not just to be a certain code like Gmail where you can do one thing, but a platform on which you can add applications and games and such, and they make it very easy to put new software that uses Facebook to run it, 
And uh, unfortunately, APIs are often insecure, and there turn out to be ways to abuse them to compromise the security of a site. So here's the Enterprise Security API Toolkits from the OWASP organization with many uh, code libraries and such that you can download and add to improve the security of your products. And uh, software change and configuration management we talked about before. Uh, if you're going to change configuration or software, there's a variety of steps you should go through to get approval and to monitor these changes so that you don't break things too much when you do them. And it is specification here. And the new emerging thing is DevOps, which Amazon is the king of. I'm not sure where they, whether they invented it. Uh, I finally got this straight when I read a book about DevOps called The Phoenix Project, which I highly recommend, which explains how the old system had an IT team that had to do all the work for people, and everybody was always more and more frustrated with the IT team for not setting up their new servers and their new software. And the DevOps system was where everybody has to be a programmer, and everybody has to automate their job, and you have to have very strict version control system to make sure that everybody is always using exactly the same version of everything. And then your whole company can move so fast that Amazon has, I think, 14,000 rolls out of new code per day or something like that. There's new code every few minutes. The developer can have an idea and put it on the site within a few minutes. So the whole company can respond immediately to anything that happens. And they can do live testing, like put up two versions of a page for an hour and then see which one is more popular and then make changes based on that. So it's much better than the old system where you'd have a release of new code every three or six months and you'd be waiting for that and you wouldn't have any changes until that one time. Anyway, I'm up to some cahoots here. And they're here. There they are. All right. So there's this one and this one. There are only two of you. All right. No more have appeared. Perhaps I'll watch the video later. Closest to English. Right, source code. All right, what method uses the same team for all steps of a project? So that's strong. I think it's a rugby term. That's the idea. All right, which one uses prototypes and dummy GUIs? That's red, rapid application development. And what's the category that includes GitHub? Okay, that is code repository. All right. Fair enough. All right, let's go back to here. See if it works to make it big. So databases, something I know a lot more about than just kind of software development. So a database is just a structured collection of data. Uh, most companies start with something like Excel, which is just flat files. And um, But anyway, the point of a database is you have some orderly place to store data like your products and payrolls and customers and so on. And you have ways to insert new data and delete data and to search through it with queries. <laughs> so you have a database management system of some kind that controls all this access and enforces the security of the database because you probably have only a few people that should be writing and changing records. And you have a lot of people that have to read and access the records and you want to control what they do. So a database administrator is like the system administrator or any other system that organizes the database and tries to make it work right. And you have a query language, the most popular being SQL. 
which is used to, it's the programming language used to write queries that update and read the data. There are various attacks. If you have high privilege and low privilege data, you can use an inference attack to accumulate many records of low privilege data to find out which data is missing, and those will be the high privilege data. Um, this is sort of like the war games auto dial that would just dial every phone number in a block to find out what was there. And then there's an aggregation attack where you combine many low privilege records to deduce high privilege data. All right. So here's the types of database. The first kind, the relational database, is by far the most common and the one that seems to suit most purposes. <laughs> All right. So a relational database looks like this. If you have a, you might have two tables. This is a very simple one. You have a table of users and a table of social security numbers. There's a field that's common between the tables, which in this simple example is username, although in more practical cases, you would use a number of some sort, like a customer ID or a social security number, because there might be two people that happen to have the same name, but they're not the same people. And you connect the table by the username. So the field is admin in one table, can be connected to the field SSN in the other table by linking the key, which would be the username. And that's, the, usually you usually have many, many more tables and such, but this is the basic idea of what a relational database is. So tables have rows, primary key is guaranteed to be unique, and the foreign key is where a matching field in another table, and you can now join the two tables by that field. So there is integrity enforced by the system. Typically you have referential integrity, so the keys always match, um, and you have entity integrity, so you don't have any blank primary keys, and you have semantic integrity, your text fields contain text, your dollar fields contain all the numbers, and so on. So here's a table that lacks integrity. It's got sick time on the right, which has got some days, and then in the middle it has an extra six, and that shouldn't be allowed. The, the database administrator has fouled up and used the wrong data type there. They used the text field for something that ought to be numbers, and now if you try to calculate how much to pay somebody for their sick time by multiplying that days by a dollar amount, you're going to get in trouble. All right. Normalization, going to companies to teach them this. Uh, normalization is the process of organizing your database so it does not have any extra copies of anything. When you don't do this right, then if you have like two or three places where someone's address is stored, then when somebody moves and they call in an address change, you might not get all the places where it goes, so you'll end up sending checks and like, other things to the wrong address. So it's uh, normalization is what Make sure that there is only one place for every important fact, and you know where it is, and you can always find it. There are database views. The data lives in the computer in a series of tables, but you typically define a view. If you go to a cash register at a fast food place, they have a simple thing there with like hamburger and Coke and fries, and that is a view of a database that removes most of the information and gives them just enough information to do their task, which is a list of the products and a place to put in something about one customer. The same thing happens when you log into Facebook and you see your profile with your picture and the stuff on your wall. There's a huge database with everything in it, but it's picked just the information that you should see and put it on your screen so you can use it. A data dictionary describes the tables. This is a schema, which is metadata, and that describes the tables and the fields and attributes and how they're connected to each other but not, it does not include the contents of the field. It's just the framework in which all the data lives. So here's a simple schema. Your employee has an SSN and a name and a title, and there's an HR table with SSN and sick time and vacation time. And the SSN has this format of digits and dashes. The name and title can be 30 characters, sick time and vacation time are days. And here the social security number is the key field in both tables and you can link those tables by the social security number when it's time to print out something like a paycheck. So um, there's various types of commands in the languages, data definition languages, and data manipulation languages. SQL is the most common query language, but there's many types. MySQL is the open source one used by Linux people. Microsoft uses ANSI SQL, and there's other ones, the one used by Oracle, and so on. They all accomplish the same thing, and they all have similar weaknesses, but they have slightly different semantics uh, of what, 
how you express things and what sort of delimiters and comment fields you use. So you create a table, create, you delete a record with delete, you can insert a record or select a record or update a record. And so you have things like this, select star from the employees table or title equals detective. That will give you all the information in the table that match that criteria. And there are hierarchical databases, DNS being the largest example, a giant distributed database on the internet. There's a bunch of servers at the root of DNS, and the only information they have is where the top level domains are, like .com and .net and .org, and those tables then have information about all the companies, like google.com and yahoo.com and so on, and the Google top domain server has information about all the various servers within Google, like www and support. And that's a hierarchical database where there's a series of levels and the uh, data contained only applies to one level. And you have to go to a different server to see the data at another level. There's object-oriented databases that use object-oriented programming we talked about before to handle data. So your data now has things like inheritance. A database integrity is just like any other integrity in the world of security, it means that data cannot be modified by unauthorized parties, and you typically enforce it with some kind of checksum, so you check to make sure that data has not been modified. Uh, if you are, for example, have a phone bank, and people are calling in, ordering a product, and you have operators typing in their addresses and such, two people might try to change the same record at the same time, and the database management system will prevent that. So that what they, instead of you, when you type in data on your uh, screen, you are not affecting the database right away. You hit, you hit a button at the end to save it, and then it attempts to commit the update. And if it is successful in committing the update, it returns a message and says, okay, that worked. If it can't perform the update, it tells you that and rolls back to a previous good point. And that's what would happen if you tried to change an address and somebody else was already changing that address. There is a database journal kept to log transactions, and there are save points to try to prevent databases from getting corrupt. There are highly available databases. There are multiple servers and there are multiple copies of the data, like Google. Google has, uh, at least I think of Brad Peters back, they have something like 10,000 servers in their main data center, and they have at least four copies of every bit of the data. So if one server goes down, there's always many other copies available to serve customers right away. Uh, you've got database replication to make a mirror, and there are shadow databases, which are just backups made, not used, but made frequently. And busy things like Visa and MasterCard and the stock exchanges have sophisticated systems of backing up very quickly so that they almost never lose any transactions. Data warehousing is where you just store a large amount of data. The biggest example being the Department of Homeland Security, a gigantic database in Utah where they're backing up everything from the internet and the telephone network for about the last 10 years. And then they've got the problem that a lot of people have. How do you find anything in that big mess of data? And that's data mining. Data mining has legitimate purposes, like cops looking for evidence, and it has more and more illegal purposes. There are a lot of people that search online to find suckers to trick into schemes or customers to send ads to and other things that uh, are sometimes illegal and sometimes just sort of shady and abusive. All right, and there's object-oriented programming where instead of your program just being a series of functions, it's a series of connected objects that then communicate by messages this is how Java and C++ and Ruby work. So you have an object, and the object has data and methods. So you can, this is called data hiding. You manipulate the object like an employee. Instead of worrying about the detailed uh, substance inside the employee, you can manipulate the object as a whole, and that's also called encapsulation. So you've got objects, and the objects have methods, which are little things they can do, like create an object and destroy an object, modify it. You can send messages to other objects, and these other concepts will get you with these diagrams. So you have an object here named Addy, and it has a method of addition. So it can receive a message that comes in from somewhere else, of one, and another message of two, and it adds them together and puts an output of three, which would go to another object. Here's delegation. Addy 
it's seven minus four, but Annie doesn't know how to do subtraction, so it passes that on to another module to handle. That's delegation, and somebody knows how to do it. And then there's polymorphism. If Annie was adding numbers, it would know how to do it, but it is, in fact, a more sophisticated program that can also add things that are not numbers, like strings to concatenate with them together. So it is, um, this is called overloaded, where you have a function that actually has two different versions, one for one type of data and one for another type of data, and it uses the same name. Then there's polyinstantiation. So you feed in not only input, but there's another piece of input which specifies your clearance level, and you will get a different answer depending on your clearance level. So the people that are not cleared for top secret will still get some kind of answer, and they will not know that they're getting a different answer than the people with more clearance. That's the idea. There are object request brokers sitting in the middle sometimes so that other programs can pass data into your uh, database system and turns it into queries. This, by the way, is where enormous security blunders tend to happen, like SQL injection. You have a request coming from one server going into another server, and because they're running different software packages, it is possible for requests to be misinterpreted and lead to disastrous results, where I'm just trying to log in but by making a malicious name with punctuation marks, my login request is misunderstood as a request to dump out all the data of the table, and that's how the vast majority of all stolen data has been stolen. Anyway, middleware includes COM, DCOM, and CORBA. COM and DCOM are Microsoft products. This, by the way, is responsible for a lot of Microsoft security problems. It's brilliant and stupid, depending on how you look at it. The point of this was you could have little functions that were originally written to run inside one application, and then you can use the COM model to take the function out of the application and share it by many applications, and you can even connect it to the network and share it with a whole bunch of machines over the internet. So code that was once written in a very narrow environment is now available to the whole world, just like I was saying earlier about people that move code up to repositories in the cloud. This makes it possible for people to sell their code and reuse their code, which is good for business, but it did lead to a lot of security disasters as code was moved into a context that the original developers had never considered, and uh, there were a whole series of Microsoft defects associated with this. <coughs> anyway, the point was to make it easy to build a software by just connecting the other pieces that you can write or buy or reuse from previous code, and that's uh, ActiveX objects and so on are uh, used in this process. Microsoft is replacing it with their most modern version of this called Microsoft.net. Corba is open vendor neutral, not Microsoft proprietary, but it does essentially the same thing. It's a way for objects to talk to other objects with the interface definition language message. So you got object-oriented analysis and design. You analyze a problem domain, you figure out what all the objects should be and how they could interact, and then you develop a solution. So it will look like this. I've got a network, and I'm going to have a sniffer object that sniffs the packets. Then I'm going to pass the captured packets over to an analysis object, which will then decide what to do with them. This is what an intrusion detection system might do. It looks at the captured packets and then it decides if any of these attacks are happening an IO service, client side attack, web attack, and then it sends it off to an alerting object, which will alert the appropriate system depending on what kind of attack it might have detected. All right, that's more cahoots. This one more. This one. All right, oh, now there's four of you. KT is up here. KT? Away. I guess 
Okay, so, all right, we shall proceed. Four questions. So, what kind of database uses joins to connect tables? That's relational database, the most common type. All right. What process removes redundant data? That's normalization. Good. What database concept is also called data hiding? Encapsulation? Aha! KT came back, I guess. All right. And which one of these is open source and vendor neutral? Four bucks. Okay. So Al's on top. Good. We got one more batch of these to go through. All right. So the effectiveness of software security. Uh, there, there's a bugs in all software, and when you fix the bugs, you often just introduce more bugs. There's nothing ever free of bugs. So there are different estimates of this, but it goes up to something like 1% of code. I see all different numbers all over the place for this, but nobody ever suggests that you get it to zero or that there's any way to get it to zero. Uh, so there are a lot of mistakes people make. Uh, they often ship things with hard-coded credentials, this is what plagued a lot of home routers. This is what led to the Mirai botnet. People bought webcams and just turned them on, and there was a default password that it didn't force you to change. So millions of them were just sitting there that can be taken over. It's buffer overflows where you set aside enough room for a certain amount of data, but there's a way to feed in more data and exceed that and corrupt memory. SQL injection where you can trick a database into doing something it shouldn't do like letting you see other people's records or your reading records. And there's path traversal, where you can, refer, at some point in the code, you refer to some object by the path, like slash users slash data slash uh, file, and the user is somehow able to manipulate that path and cause it to point to some other file. So you're able to read or write to some part of a file system that you weren't supposed to get to. And one common example of a very similar error is PHP, because PHP web pages, instead of having a name.html, typically have a name.php question mark file equals and then a file name. And you can often point that file to a different file on the server or even a file on another server and add code and run code on a server that didn't come from that server. That's the most common problem in PHP. It leads to uh, inappropriate read and write access to the server very often in practice when people write PHP code. So as the buffer overflow there, you put in something that uses up more room than their reserved space. Another one that happens is race conditions. Um, one thing people frequently do, I certainly do this a lot in my sloppy servers, I need to remember something, so I write it to the temp folder. Then later on, I go and read it from the temp folder. This is a way to move data from one program to another, but the problem is you don't know that somebody else didn't change it in that time period. If you, if you wanted to write something and then trust that it hasn't changed later, you really shouldn't be just putting it in the temp folder. You should be putting it in some kind of folder that nobody else has permission to get to or doing something more intelligent with it, and that's called uh, race condition. All the attacker has to do is be quick enough to insert data at just the right time and they can cause something unexpected to happen. A famous example of this was the mad cow vulnerability about two years ago that would let you escalate to root on Linux servers. Cross-site scripting lets you put script in one context and it is inappropriately executed in a different context. So you might go to Facebook and put a comment on your wall that includes script tags, and then when somebody else looks at your comment, the script runs on their machine and does something. Uh, the browser exploitation framework is a tool that comes with uh, Kali, a uh, hacking tool that exploits this and lets you see all the joy of doing this, uh, lets you add it to a network and trick people into going through that like a proxy that can then keep adding JavaScript to pages they're serving. See, 
This is one of the many reasons why it's good that the web is rapidly switching to HTTPS. And because if you're viewing an HTTPS page, someone cannot get in the middle between you and the server and alter the code. Not anything like as easily as they used to. Cross-site request forgery is also common, where you create a malicious URL and trick someone into clicking on it, and now it uses their credentials to do something, like transfer money, or you steal a cookie. And then you add the cookie to your request to trick a server into thinking that you have permission to do something that you should not have permission to do. Privilege escalation is the general uh, attack where you escalate from a low-level user to a higher-level user. You can increase yourself from a standard Windows user up to administrator or from a domain user up to a domain administrator. And there is horizontal escalation where you don't increase towards administrator, you just use another user's account at your level, which is, of course, also bad to the violates privacy. Backdoors are unexpected ways to control a system that are not known or, or expected. Um, when people manage to infect a server with rootkits, they usually make a backdoor, so there's another way in. But a lot of systems are shipped with backdoors. Um, they are often put there by developers, so they have some way to get at the system if it's defective, and then they forget to remove it. Uh, but there's a whole series, this is among the more common problems, that some product is in use, and then you discover there's a secret way in, a secret password that lets everybody in. I, every couple of years, some student comes to me and tells me there's a secret backdoor into Windows. And I don't think there is, but it's a persistent rumor. But it is true that quite a lot of products have shipped with backdoors, and that is bad when it comes out. Uh, so this takes you to disclosure when security researchers find some kind of problem, like a backdoor or a buffer overflow, there are various ways to deal with it. In the old days, it was very common to just do full disclosure. Then people tried to move towards responsible disclosure where you would privately tell the vendor, and then the vendor would work with you to make sure they understand the problem and patch it. In practice, this is a very fraught process. Uh, I've done lots of this. I've notified hundreds of people with vulnerabilities, and almost none of them could care less or do anything about it or even respond in any good way. Um, so it is very common that the researcher tries to tell the company and they don't do anything, and then they have to go to full disclosure anyway. Uh, the current standard that seems to be accepted in the community is if you tell the vendor and then wait sometime like 30 to 90 days before dumping it publicly, you will not be considered reckless and unreasonable. But it's quite variable. There are a very small number of vendors like Microsoft and Facebook and Google that will actually talk to you intelligently and even pay you an award if you find something. Most of the others will just lie, deny there's a problem, blame the researcher, otherwise. It's a pretty fraught process. All right, um, the software capability maturity model from Carnegie Mellon is a methodical framework to try to uh, create high quality software like the we were talking about before. Uh, here's the levels, you have an initial uh, level of maturity where you're just ad hoc and chaotic. Your developers write stuff and there is no actual review to make it um, secure. Then there's repeatable development, which is basic project management, where you have some kind of process. And then you can have a documented standardized process and a process that's managed where you actually control it and measure the quality. And the one that I mentioned over and over again is the modern standard. Everything should be optimized. You should have a plan of, of how to make your stuff secure. You should then have a measurement of how secure it is, and you should then have an improvement stage where you try to improve your process and fix whatever defects you picked up. And you have to have a constant loop of that because since software and hardware changes so fast, you can't just keep using any system for long without it becoming out of date. So you don't get the top security marks unless you have an optimizing cycle of process. Uh, here's a qualifications board that has four levels to test software. User acceptance means it, it does what the user expects, that operational acceptance, enough acceptance to meet a contract, and enough acceptance to comply with the standard as well. So there's uh, another, a big issue affecting a lot of people is 
that you don't actually develop all your code yourself. You buy some of it from other people, and now you don't really know what you're getting. Uh, recently, the government has told us to quit using Chinese routers, and now they told us to quit using Kaspersky antivirus, and there are many concerns. So commercial off-the-shelf software is if you just buy some product, like say a Microsoft development environment or a Adobe thing, you build it into your product, and then you're just dependent on them. So you might wonder if you can really trust their claims about their product, and what are you gonna do if they get acquired and go broke or abandon that product line with your issues? So if you have custom developed third-party products, you have to consider this when you're contracting with them if you hire somebody to write a library, are they really going to maintain it? Are they really going to be there five years later to deal with the problems and so on? Service level agreements are one way to handle this, where they promise a certain level of service and you have some kind of clear responsibility and punishment if that doesn't happen. And then comes the world of artificial intelligence. This is really happening in a big hurry. I saw in the news last week there was a uh, AI that knew nothing about chess, and it played chess for four hours, it became a grandmaster. And there's another AI that NASA just used, or some researcher, to find the first extrasolar planet, the extrasolar star with eight planets, by analyzing astronomical data that was too complex for humans to analyze. So this is really coming, and one product that the vendors have been promising us for about 10 years now is an artificial intelligent intrusion detection system that will spot attacks on the wire that are not just matching a known signature, but in its wisdom, it can just tell what's unusual traffic on the wire. That's not for sale yet, but it looks like very soon it will be for sale. So these are expert systems. Uh, you have a knowledge base of some sort where it has some rules, and you have an inference engine which tries to deduce them from the knowledge base. These things are used for like things like as assistance for doctors recommend what to do based on symptoms, and there are multi-layer neural networks where instead of just looking up rules in a database, it just learns from experience. So what you do, it has some input of like chess game that you're playing, and it knows the rules of chess, and it's told whether you want or lost. And then it just practices like humans do as babies. You just do things and gradually learn and figure out how things work without anybody programming you or telling you how to do it, all they tell you is whether you won or lost, and you try to win more than you lose. Uh, Bayesian filtering is one technique used here. This was used to block spam. You just have a list of certain words, and as you know, the spam people quickly learn to misspell words to get past this. It wasn't very effective to stop spam, but it is one of the components used in artificial intelligence systems. And genetic algorithms is another one where you have programs and then they mate with other programs and mix the two together and have a certain chance of errors to try to imitate the process of biological evolution. All right. And that's the last bit. So one more to hoot. Here. PHP. It's file inclusion, and by the way, I noticed right up here, the Kahoot URL is a good example. It has 
instead of having a different HTML file for every quiz, it's got this quiz ID field, which somehow specifies the quiz. And you might be able to do something like dot, dot, slash, dot, dot, slash, etc, password. And if it was vulnerable, you could dump out the password file from a server. That's the kind of thing that goes on when you have uh, file inclusion vulnerabilities. Anyway. All right, what flaw is also called the race condition? That's it, time of check, time of use. You have the period between those two things and the attacker can get away with something. All right, what problem is caused by developers leaving test code in a finished product? <laughs> The back door is the most common one where they have some back door in the early days when they're worried about, for example, some kind of a failure of the authentication method, but then they leave that into final code. All right, and what's Carnegie Mellon's software quality framework? CMM, okay, the content maturity model, I think. All right, well, I think that's it. You've been through the whole thing. Um, let me know if you guys get the certification. I'm sort of interested. Uh, anybody got any questions about anything? Well, I guess that's it then. I don't think there's anything more to this course. Uh, the online quizzes will be up for a while. Have a good Christmas, folks, and I hope you get your CISSB certification. Okay, farewell. I'm glad you're happy, KT. I appreciate it. If you guys want to go to any more of my courses, they're all streamed like this all the time. So I don't know who would want to do that, but you certainly can if you like. Okay. Farewell. And Mike Hoots, I use lots of acronyms. Uh, well, the, the CISSP showed that as well. Well, I'm glad you asked that. Um, I'm not sure, but I very much want to remind you, you need to get a real CISSP practice engine like the transcender, because it's not just the issue of acronyms. They phrase the questions in a very strange way, and you really have to get used to that. My questions are much easier, because I ask a simple question with a simple answer. They, their questions are sort of deliberately vague and confusing, so be sure and get a practice test before you pay 650 bucks for the real test. Okay, Katie, I hope it works out. But don't, don't think you're ready just because of this course. You've got to go through a practice test. Yeah, get the transcender. I highly recommend it. I had no problem passing if you get the transcender and you really practice it, but without that, it would be miserable. Because the, the question, it's not just knowing the material, it's knowing the weird way they talk. Okay. Farewell, folks. Good. Forming a study group? Yeah, it might contact KT. He's got a good plan there. You sound like you're going to get it. Okay. Any other questions? All right, I'm off then. <laughs>